Hello, uh, the great Johannes here. Uh, my name is Johannes Matthias Conrad, Johannes Matthias Conrad in Dutch. Um, and I do regular live streams, and so I'm going to start one now. Uh, I used, I tried streaming on YouTube yesterday, but it didn't work because they have like 20 second delay and so on. And I couldn't interact with the audience who were writing me messages. So I'll just stick with TikTok as long as I don't get suspended from this platform. So as people are coming in, uh, today's topic is going to be over socialized leftists or genocidal leftists, as you might also call them. Uh, <clears throat> I saw, a, incidentally, I saw a video today by a, a TED talk. I used to be a great fan of the TED conferences uh, 10 or 20 years ago when they were actually interesting. Nowadays, you know, TED for a long time now has been this massive uh, pro leftist, progressive, communist, you know, nonsense thing. But once in a while, they reveal something. So once in a while, one of these uh, green, good doing leftists reveals something about their psychology, which is just telling it explains everything about who they are. Now, there was this one talk called uh, How to Green the World's Deserts and Reverse Climate Change by uh, Alan Savory or Savory or Savory, whichever way you pronounce it. And although his talk is ingenious, he, he explains uh, uh, that, for example, climate change is not caused by burning fossil fuels, but actually by desertification. Turns out during the day, deserts are hot. The sunlight evaporates all the water that is stored in these desert sands, in the desert lands. For example, after it rains, a lot of water is in the soil, but then uh, instead of crops growing out of the soil, the hot sun evaporates all that water again, but takes with it a lot of CO2, a lot of carbon dioxide, meaning a lot of carbon is extracted from desert soils and injected into the atmosphere in the world. More, uh, more than fossil fuel burning. So people driving cars are not even the so-called number one cause of the carbon dioxide increases in the atmosphere. And that is you know, aside from the fact, aside from the fact whether or not you even believe that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is the true cause of uh, of climate change, which may, may which may also be debatable. So in any case, in any case, it's not farting cows, it's not fossil fuels per se. It's actually the deserts evaporating carbon right into the atmosphere. That is the the reason why uh, CO2 is rising in the planet. But this again doesn't necessarily mean that the climate is changing. That's a whole other d debate. I remember um, uh, reading a scientific article like 20 years ago that said, okay, uh, CO2 is rising and humans are involved in increasing the CO2 rises uh, through the industry and fossil fuel, right? And blah, blah, blah. But the one connection, the fact that uh, that CO2 was actually responsible for rising temperatures, this fact had not been scientifically established. And I read that in a scientific magazine. You know? So I want to talk about Alan Savory's talk about greening the deserts, precisely because it uh, betrays <laughs> what, what leftist men are really about, how they really think, namely they're genocidal. So I'm not a psychologist here, but you know I have every right to question the dynamics of academic intellectuals who repeatedly say, trust the science. Where have we heard that before? We've been hearing that a lot uh, in recent years, right? Because they more and more use science as a sort of authoritative dogma that humanity must submit to science. We say the science is so, therefore, who are you to deny science? You're a science denier. You're a climate denier. You're a history, you're, you're a revisionist, right? Uh, but then they go on and, and do really bad things to humanity that leads to hundreds and hundreds of thousands of deaths worldwide or millions or tens of millions, right? And then all of a sudden, uh, they have to admit, oh, sorry, the science were, was wrong. We were wrong. And now, you know, uh, we were wrong, and now all of a sudden we uh, we realize how wrong we were. And uh, uh, well, but at least we're still good people. We did our best, and our motivations were were you know were uh, were good, right? Uh, our <laughs> and they are the ones destroying the world. Turns out this Alan Savory guy, he also trusted the science at some point in his life that said that uh, overgrazing land by, pa by ca uh, sorry, by livestock, by cattle, was supposedly, allegedly, the reason why lush green landscapes turned into deserts. 
and that human beings were, were, <coughs> were totally at fault because human pastoralists herding their cattle around, they were the ones directing the cattle, making them overgraze. And this is why we had deserts. And, and that is why at some point, Mr. Savary himself convinced African governments that they should kill off 40,000 elephants to save the land and to prevent uh, uh, desertification of the lands. Turns out he was wrong. He had 40,000 elephants killed and he was wrong. Okay. And I'm going to tell you the story of what happened. So there's something, something peculiar about these people, these leftist scientists, always making such bad decisions. They're all leftists. You know, the average genocidal leftist is a sort of meek, weak man, um, psychologically deeply enmeshed with his mother. You know, you come out of your mom's womb, but then you are supposed to become independent. But the leftish man never become really independent. And perhaps evolution can even explain the existence of such men. Leftist men serve to defend the mothers against potential, you know, more masculine male aggressors. This is understandable. In fact, it is the role that every boy plays in every household. You know, you protect your mom, right? But this is also the role men are supposed to abandon when they grow up. You know, when you become a grown ass man, you're not supposed to uh, make your whole life about protecting your mom. You're supposed to go out and live your own life. Right? Uh, someone sends me lots of roses. Thank you very much. You know, so, but not so for the left wing man. The left wing man suffers quietly as mommy's eternal boy. In adulthood, he still perceives the outside world as incomprehensibly hostile and sets out to banish evil from the world, generally by seeking the total elimination of said perceived evil. In Alan Savory's case, that evil, as he explains in his TED talk, was livestock. Growing up in Africa, he thought livestock was responsible for destroying the land and turning it into a desert. So the cattle grazing the earth, he believed, uh, were overgrazing the soil, thereby leaving the land vulnerable to desertification. And once the process of desertification set in, people could no longer grow crops on them, and so people began going hungry and starving. So this guy grows up truly hating livestock, cattle, cows, thinking that this is the, this is the real problem in the world. And you know, you know what? A lot of the, the arguments for veganism and vegetarianism also come from this. They truly believe, meaning they convince themselves that cattle grazing the land, right, turns it into a desert by overgrazing, right? And that is why people are starving and hungry. If only we taught people to eat more vegetables, then we would not eat cattle anymore. We would do away with the livestock. Then the lands would heal, right? And, and then everybody would have enough food. Turns out that this isn't so. And he himself admits that. And it shows you how, what kind of people they are. So the cattle grazing the earth. Now our attention. So once the process of desertification sets in, people can no longer grow crops on them. And the carbon dioxide released from that soil, from the desert soil, into the atmosphere now uh, leaves the soil infertile and also increases the CO2 in the atmosphere, right? And notably, desertification releases as much, if not more, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere as the burning of fossil fuels does. So it's not fossil fuel. You know, you know what it might be? It might be that the whole story of fossil fuel is a lie and that it does not contribute to uh, raising temperatures because uh, deserts do. Deserts release way more carbon dioxide than you driving a car, right? So that might be the issue. Savory then chased large amounts of livestock off of Africa's plains only to see no betterment of the soil. I mean, the idea was if you, they thought that cattle was turning land into deserts and that is bad for everybody because the people go hungry, right? And then he thought, well, you know, maybe if we make African people eat vegan, right? That's better for the environment, right? Uh, despite vegan foods, of course, being detrimental to human health because uh, human beings are made of animal fat and protein. So our brains are pure animal fat and protein. We're supposed to eat animal fat and protein, but no, let's force people to go vegan because it's good for the environment, except they got it all wrong. So alas, eliminating his perceived enemy, livestock, made no difference. The desertification of the lands continued. 
despite there being no more cattle. Eh? Fuck Palestine, fuck Israel too. So many people go into your comments and they say like, free Palestine, no, screw you, you know. So, all right, so, and so he chases the livestock off of the African lands, forcing the Africans to go vegan, all right, which is absolutely a terrible crime because you really harm their, their physical health and possibly their mental health as well, you know. And then, you know, the desertification of the lands continued regardless. But instead of going back to the drawing board, Savory doubled down, not livestock alone, but also wild elephants were now the problem. You see, he chased off all the cattle and the wildebeest or whatever was grazing there. And now he's got, well, there's got to be one more problem. It's got to be elephants, right? <laughs> And so he wants to do something about the, the elephant problem. Here I imagine, you know, you know, in Marxist propaganda, how do they how do they depict capitalists? Always like these fat, big men who eat too much, right? Because they're rich, they've got all the money, they stuff. And so you can imagine that a Marxist leftist man projects his hatred for capitalists onto elephants because like like the caricature in Marxist propaganda, elephants are these big fat people, right? Uh, who eat too much greens, like the capitalists, they take too much greenbacks, green money, right? America, an American dollar is called a greenback sometimes. And so the elephants, they graze and they graze and they graze so much and they're thinking, well, that must be the problem then. These mammalian capitalists with their long trunks, they are, they are the, the cause of turning lands into deserts and starving people. Turns out then, Savory imagined this, that the elephants, like the stereotypically fat capitalist men, were taking in too much of the greens and leaving the infertile soil depleted of carbon dioxide so that plants can't grow. And so Savory convinced African governments they needed to kill 40,000 elephants. This really happened, by the way. African governments listened to this, this white guy, this white leftist scientist, and they actually killed 40,000 elephants. It's not like they were an endangered species. It's not like that, say, 3,000 years ago, we had 5 million Afri uh, elephants in Africa down to maybe a couple hundred thousand, and he, he decides to kill 40,000 of them. It's not like you could have reasoned, if you use your brain, you could have reasoned that all, obviously elephants did not destroy the climate. Neither did mam uh, mammals, you know? So after having killed off the 40,000 elephants, though, again, nothing happened. The soil did not improve. It was only after having satisfied his genocidal bloodlust, projected onto elephants and cattle and livestock, that Savory, after hard work, concluded that livestock was, in fact, a requirement to keep the soil healthy. Turns out he got it all wrong. In fact, the truth was the opposite of what science said. That's funny. You know, in the past few years, you hear those people say, like, trust the science, trust the science, trust the science. And then you find out that the exact opposite was true. How often doesn't that happen? How is it possible that these leftist intellectuals, right, they, they say that based on science, this has to be true. And you're saying that, well, no, I use my brain for reasoning. And I reason that what you're saying can't be true. The science must be wrong. And they call you a fascist and a Nazi. And you're this and you're that. Right? And you're evil and you're bad. And then it turns out that you were right and they were wrong because they listened to the science, but they did it unthinkingly. They did not reason about what they were doing, right? So how come cattle, livestock is actually a requirement to keep the soil healthy, right? Indeed, when livestock move around in large natural herds, they urinate and fertilize the soil with their manure to the point of protecting the soil. They also trample the vegetation, which helps to protect the soil from drying out in the hot African sun. Thus, he found out, finally, that the solution to desertification was not to remove livestock, but to increase the number of cattle by 400%. And that means a lot more people can start eating milk, dairy products, meat, animal fat, animal protein, right? Which is what we're supposed to do. The real cause of desertification had never been overgrazing, but undergrazing. The humans of the past who had turned these lands into deserts through their pastoralist uh, policies, uh, they didn't do so because they were bad people overgrazing. It's not like pastoralism is evil. Turns out pastoralism is good for the world. You just need to do it in the right quantity, namely a lot. You need to have large herds. The only mistake humans made is what they turned these 
large unmanageable herds, herds into smaller, more manageable herds, and that was the cause of the problem for the desertification. Okay, so the real cause of desertification uh, uh, you know, was not overgrazing but undergrazing. And the solution to keep our soils healthy was then to have more cattle, not less. But this also implies that human beings now ought to eat more animal fat and protein. It goes against the wisdom of the vegan movement. The vegans say we shouldn't eat uh, pastoralism or meat, milk, and dairy because the cows, blah, 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 they, cause CO they cause CO2. Farting cows cause CO2. Farting cows play a totally minimal role in causing carbon dioxide increases in the atmosphere. We just heard that it's actually deserts. When the sun shines on a desert and the rain has fallen, the water evaporates and it takes with it the carbon from the soil. And that's the number one reason in the world why uh, the CO2 levels in the atmosphere increase due to deserts releasing the carbon. It's not even fossil fuels and it's certainly not farting cows, you know. It means that veganism is actually killing the planet by reducing the demand for pastoralism. Western political policy couldn't be more absurd in this respect. Many North European nations today, for example, are actively deforesting their lands. And they are also chasing cattle farmers out of their nations, such as in the Netherlands and so on, right? Both of which ultimately lead to desertification. So they're turning, the health, they're turning the healthy Western lands into deserts while they say they want to heal the deserts of the rest of the world. And the contrast between ecological reality and political policy suggests that the genocidal leftists are still hard at work trying to destroy the Western world, namely by risking the desertification of European and North American lands perhaps in their weirdest attempts to make the climate more equal around the globe. I call that climate Marxism. Uh, climate Marxism is the belief that all the land, all the, all the, say, climatic regions in the world should also be equalized. So they really can't stand any form of natural inequality. They basically, leftists, essentially hate nature. They hate it so much because nature thrives when there is inequality. I could explain this uh, by explaining you something about a natural forest. In a natural forest, you have very old trees that are tall and have lots of foliage. But, but because of the shadow they cast, there are other smaller life forms that manage to thrive down below. Whereas, if you have, and sometimes when a big tree dies, it opens up the sky, right? There's more light in that spot so that younger trees can then grow. But in a, what is called a managed forest, such as a forest in the Netherlands, where all the trees are planted in the same distance from one another, and at the same time, they all grow in the same, at the same speed, but the overall quality of these trees is lower than that of the trees in the natural forest, because in the natural forest, only the strongest trees survive. It's the struggle of the fittest, right? the Darwinian struggle of the fittest makes the trees in a natural forest stronger. Their wood is stronger. Whereas the wood of uh, artificially planted forests tends to be brittle precisely because humans tried to make these forests more equal. Either way, uh, the contrast between ecological reality, or I said so. So perhaps Climate Marxist in the end, climate Marxism in the end, must therefore lead to the unintended and regrettable death of billions of people. But hey, at least leftist men were just trying to do the right thing, and their motives were honorable, for they alone were trying to protect the Earth Mother from evildoers. Right, because they were, of course, the evildoers themselves, you know. Let me take a little sip. I sometimes drink a half a glass of wine a day and I buy the cheapest wine possible because I'm not rich. So I just buy a the cheapest glass bottle. So it's for under two euros here in Europe. And it's not even bad, you know. Okay. You know, climate care. And you, you remember this guy? Uh, I forgot his name. Let me look it up, you know. Not this guy. But Al Gore, Al Gore, who lost to the George Bush uh, during the elections uh, long ago, Al Gore has always been warning us of the, the death of the climate. But 
Al Gore is going to want to ban TikTok because he doesn't like people to have alternative opinions that show that the United States is full of shit. You know? You know, everywhere you go, <clears throat> yeah, I've written several books. You can go to my Amazon, uh, Revival of the West, for example, or uh, Behold the Wanderer. Those are books of mine. Uh, I'll start advertising my books a little bit. Maybe I can put one of my books on screen here. I, uh, I'm using TikTok Live Studio, and it lets me show pictures, but it's a bit of a hassle to get it, to get it done. I got my folder. I got my publications folder right here. I'll show you my my most popular book, the one that people are actually buying. All right. I'll put it on. How, I guess you can see my book moving around now. Uh, Revival of the West, uh, Securing a Future for European People. This is my best-selling book so far. It has good reviews. All right. I wanted to check it out. <clears throat> oh, people have been asking me some questions, though. Have I ever gotten threats? No, not not that I take it seriously anyway. So uh, thoughts about electric vehicles. It's over engineered. You know, you have these cars are heavier. The battery is very heavy and you have to have different kinds of fuels like like the lithium and so on. And although they're innovating the battery life life lifespan, they're basically an inferior product. Right, uh, gasoline-fueled cars are lightweight, right, and they uh, you don't need an expensive battery. You can sell your car as a second hand on, on uh, wherever on uh, Craigslist if you wanted to, but it's hard to sell a second hand uh, electric car because the battery will be dead and people are not going to buy a new battery. It, it's a step back, really, but they promote it as though this is the new great thing, probably because not because fossil fuels are dying out, but because of the cost of extracting fossil fuels. They simply switch to another uh, source, namely lithium, right? And try to do it that way for some time. But then again, uh, it's unlikely that these kinds of solutions will last, you know. Do I believe in monarchy? Yeah, I think monarchy is a good idea. Uh, I believe in aristocracy, really. I think an aristocracy, an actual aristocracy, the, meaning the rule of the best, that people who are actually competent in what they do should be in charge, you know. Vegans in the spiritual community also claim we can't raise our vibrations when we eat meat. That's probably the opposite of what's true. Uh, I suppose people are, can be much more in tune with their, their, with their soul and their spirit and so on, with their spiritual side, if they would just eat red meat and drink some wine occasionally. <clears throat> All right, so I was talking about these over-socialized leftists who turn into genocidal leftists because they think they are working in the name of Mother Earth. They identify their own mother probably with Earth, right? And they want to do everything they can do to protect the mother. And then they have to choose an enemy, right? And it can be elephants, livestock, the middle class, white men, men in general. They come up with this image of the enemy that they seek to root out. They think they need to systematically undermine these people because they're not going to use open violence because they can't be seen using violence. So they use more like the, the strategy of poisoning or the strategy of slow, deliberate uh, demoralization and subversion. You know? I do have a Gab account, but I don't use it. Uh, what was it? You can go to my linkedin.bio slash johannesmk and find all my links. I'll, I'll post it in the comments. LinkedIn bio slash johannesmk. I think my gab is listed there as well. I just don't really use it. I, I just use popular websites like uh, you have TikTok, you have uh, Twitter, X. It seems to be workable. And I do, I do post copies of my videos to Rumble and so on, but I, I'm not active on these platforms, and that's the that's the whole deal, you know. Uh, and so, I was thinking about uh, the subversion tactics that are being used against us, and I have a very clear example. There, there was this very popular right-wing website in the Netherlands, or more like a blog. Uh, 
called geenstyle.nl or nostyle.nl. Anyway, you don't have to visit the website to understand it. The website always gave you, uh, for a long time, very right-wing insights, like the right-wing side of the reality, in quite a serious tone, but also uh, in their own style. But the thing with this website is they then also regularly start posting uh, pro-LGBT content mixed in with the right-wing content. And this is something that you've noticed that, that they've been doing for a very long time, uh, internationally speaking, in the Western world. Uh, you had the alt-right movement of the 2000s, of the 2010s, really. You know, the alt-right movement with, I don't know, uh, Nick Griffin and, uh, you know, uh, Milo Yiannopoulos. And then a lot of those ones are also all into the LGBT scene. And then you have, like, Turning Point USA. Have you ever wondered what exactly they're trying to turn? Turning Point USA, all these... And then you have Douglas Murray, you know, the author of uh, The End of Europe. Uh, all these people are posing as conservatives or even as right-wingers while at the same time pushing the LGBT, slipping it in as like the new value or something. You know, the joke goes around that uh, the Republican Party says that um, uh, the, the, the normal rainbow flag is the real conservative flag, whereas the, the pedo flag, that's, that's too far. That's gone too far, you know? You know, that's a Daily Stormer was founded by a Jew. You know, it's a total joke. You shouldn't watch this. You really need to understand who is who in this in this movement. Uh, you know, if someone in someone in their past life used to be a hardcore Marxist Jew and they turn around and pretend to be a, a Nazi, then they're they're fooling you. You don't you don't go there. Like just like the UNZ report, UNS report, also a Jew, or uh, you know, there are so many so many con artists going on there. What do they do is, it's called subversion. They give you what you want to hear, and then they slip in the LGBT, or they slip in, you know, you know, why can't gay men adopt children? Why can't they buy a child? You know, as though it's perfectly normal for a child to grow up without a mother, right? You're robbing a child of a mother, and I'm supposed to go along with that? Of course not. What happens to me personally is that I actually tune out of these platforms. You know, I'm drawn into the platform at first because of the content, but then I realize, wait a minute, they're trying to subvert me or like, infil like poison my mind by adding content that I don't agree with at all. And now it doesn't change my mind on my right-wing beliefs. It also doesn't really change my mind on the LGBT people. What it really does is it, it makes me disconnect from all these controlled opposition platforms. I just want nothing to do with it anymore, you know? Uh, red wine is tasty, man. It gives you some psychological energy because there's a reason why in Christianity, in Catholicism, for example, you uh, you eat bread that is the flesh of Christ and you drink wine that is the blood of Christ. What are you really doing? Well, it's a sort of magical trans transfer of powers by eating Christ's body, which is a spiritual form of uh, cannibalism you're not really eating a human body but it you know it symbolizes that that's what you're doing you're transferring some of god's own body right into yourself and it becomes part of you it's a transfer of power uh to the people power to the people really i thought that's actually if you think about things like that those those rituals why do they do them it's quite interesting actually yeah so for those of you just tuning in, uh, I'm just talking about over-socialized leftists. And uh, I was veering off, and as I usually do, I talk about many different topics after I talk about the main topic. So uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to peel an orange on my live show. Uh, you know, uh, the American social media platforms, they got a real problem because nobody uses them anymore. You know, you try to, I tried streaming on YouTube yesterday, although I have like a thousand followers, I got two people in my stream. I got a 20 second delay between their questions and my answers, right? Uh, it's, and they don't even have a, like TikTok offers me this, this software for my laptop called uh, Live Studio and it works perfectly. I can have like vertical or horizontal videos. I, can, it's ba I know it's built on top of OBS Studio and I know YouTube invests in OBS, but YouTube doesn't have a normal downloadable studio for live streaming. You know how ludicrous that is? They are the, like, they used to be, I think used to be the number one streaming platform in the world. And now they're, they're out of that market because they just didn't, they didn't care about their users, I think. They were so busy figuring out ways to censor people that they forgot that they actually need users to, 
to keep a platform. You can't just go around banning people and then expect people to continue to come to your platform to listen to your version of the truth when you've banned literally everybody who was interesting to listen to, like Joe Rogan and so on, right? Uh, or remember Molyneux? I don't, I don't, I don't trust Molyneux, Stefan Molyneux, but he was interesting, right? And they threw all these people off of the platform. You expect people to come back? No, they go to TikTok. And now you got to ban TikTok. <laughs> you know, if you ban TikTok, people are not coming back to Instagram and Facebook and YouTube. These platforms are dead. They're dead. Like the, the American social media killed themselves off with censorship. It's your own damn fault. You know, why did you do that? You know, well, let me have my orange first. I mean, this is the problem with Americans. They did. They start out with the right idea. They executed first. They got. They basically dominated social media globally, and then they just destroy it by banning everybody who was interesting because they can't control the narrative. Well, maybe you shouldn't lie so much now, huh? Maybe you shouldn't make the existence of the USA about merely protecting. Uh, Zion and Israel, maybe you should be able to explain to people why exactly should we support Israel other than the fact that you are rabid Zionists. What's, what's in it for the rest of the world? Well, there seems to be no real benefit, see? There's no benefit for people in Europe to support Israel any longer. Why should we do that? I think oranges are one of the tastiest fruits in the world. <laughs> but I can still do without them. You know, being a European, normally we don't have uh oranges of course in the past we didn't have these kind of fruits but uh i think tomatoes we had tomatoes though and apples and pears do grow over here my grandfather believe it or not used to grow oranges So people are coming into my live show to watch me eat oranges. Huh? Someone got a warning for a comment. I don't I don't know if I saw your comment. They probably hid it for me. I didn't see it. Wild berries, yeah, wild berries, that's also true, yeah. Very good. Yeah, the rabbis own PH, yeah, P Hub. Yeah, but have you have you heard about it? That I was just talking about subversion. On P Hub, they're showing you like you know, straight content and then they slip in, you know, actors who had bottom surgery, if you know what I mean. They had their ding dongs cut off and rebuilt, and they slip those in as well. I don't watch that crap, you know. I don't think anyone should. It, all these platforms, they, here is how it works. They give you what you want, so you come into the platform, and then they slip in all, all, all sorts of other shit to try to subvert your mind. But it doesn't even work in my view. I think most people catch on to this. And go, I don't want this shit. And then they just leave, right? <laughs> you don't stay up. You, you don't turn people gay by showing them, by force feeding them gay content. I think what happens is people will be leaving, like, oh, they're just gonna leave. They're gonna hate porn forever. So that's what I think is gonna happen. I think people are just gonna leave P Hub, you know? The Goyim Defense League, yeah. The ADL, right? No, oh no. <laughs> the opposite. Oh. So, subversion, man, that is the, bill, the, real, the real problem in our world. Uh, but you, you got to learn to tune out. And of course, regular daytime TV and evening TV has always been that way, right? They give you what you want and then they slip in other points of view that they want you to adopt. Uh, something like The Daily Show and uh, The Colbert Report, they're really good at you know, giving you fun content you want to watch, but then they also slip in the political messaging. Disney does it too. Disney is also all about subversion. They call it political messaging. They give you the sort of movies they think you want to see, right, with the princesses and the heroes and whatever, right? Everybody wants to see those. And then they slip in gender neutral and trans characters and uh, every second character is gay and whatever. And you have like gender confused queer, queer characters that play the leading role and People are tuning out. The response is for people once they catch on. Hey, this is odd. Like if you do it once, you can get away with it. 
You do it twice, people will forgive you. You do it three times, people are going like, mm-hmm, so, so, right? But if you keep doing it all the time, people will tune out, but then you lose that demographic. They're not coming back anymore. You know, people my age think of Walt Disney and we think of the classic cartoons, The Lion King and so on. We think of, hey, that's quality, right? But people who are half my age, they only know Disney as that, that company that promotes gay faggotry and queer queer characters they don't know disney any other way they are not coming back if if disney changes its tune that younger demographic who grew up with disney being so subversive they're not going to come back to disney anymore because they will always think of disney as that you know why does everything have to be gay nowadays young kids are asking this you know teenagers 20 year olds everybody's wondering like why is everybody why they turn everything gay why does everything have to be gay all the time because it's naturally not what they want and i think the reason is very simple most people are straight and most straight people envision themselves growing up having a family and if you are telling them that they can't have that they're going to tune out they're not going to listen to you anymore i think that's what it is you know love what you're doing my friend you're a very good man yeah is it over for europe no of course not europe is only getting started now you know we don't have uh you know we have aging populations, but the solution can be is the solution is self-evident. It's a bit radical. We just need to get rid of the old people. That's it, really. I, my idea is we send the old people to war, the old men to war, and the old women we send send them to Africa. You know, because I think if old people are really the only reason why we need more immigrants coming to the West to wipe old people's asses basically and to provide for them. If that's the only real reason, then we need to just deal on our own. We, we have to deal with the, our elderly. We have an elderly problem. We have too many old people. And wh what are we going to do about it? Well, maybe the governments are actually giving them jabs to kill them off, you know. But, you know, it's not impossible for us to do something about this. I don't know if you've ever heard the story about... Uh, what they did in Iceland. Once upon a time in Iceland, this is written in the Icelandic sagas. You can find them online on uh, sagadb.org. Uh, let me check if that is the actual link, sagadb.org. And you have, um, well, I don't know by heart. Yeah, sagadb.org. I don't know by heart uh, which story it was. But anyway, in one of these Icelandic sagas, they explained that there was a moment in Iceland, in Viking Age Iceland, where the whole island was starving because there were too many people, too many old people. They had a bad harvest for several summers, and so they didn't have food to feed people. So the strong men on horseback, they gathered at the old thing, the, first, uh, the world's first parliament uh, near Reykjavik, and they gathered there talking, uh, deciding what to do, and the decision was made. We need to kill all the old people, all the sick people, and all the weak people. So they went around the island, these strong men on their horses, went around the island, presumably with hammers, and they would whack like whack-a-mole. They would whack the old, the weak, uh, and the sickly, killing them off. But in doing so, they saved everybody else. They prevented the starvation by killing off the weak, the old, and the sickly. In fact, this is what predators do. Predators in the wild, they, they don't naturally attack the healthy, mature animals. They attack the young, meaning the weak, right? They attack the sickly, the dying, right? And the old, the very old ones. In fact, lions, lionesses, will be very respectful toward a very old wildebeest. If, if they see a wildebeest dying, the lionesses will simply lie down in the grass waiting for the old wildebeest to die of natural death, and then they eat them. That's how respectful they are. That's amazing, right? Uh, hyenas are not like that. Hyenas will simply start nipping at your belly and they start eating you while you're still alive. Bears also do that. Brown bears, they will just rip you open and start, just start eating you while you're still alive. But lions are different. Lions, uh, they respectfully wait for you to die or they kill you first by choking you, but they grab you in the, in the, in the throat to choke you and then they will uh, respectfully uh, kill you before they start eating you. And that's the big difference, you know. Uh, some people are still writing me questions here. Yeah. So I've bought your book last week in Australia and received it today. Oh, that's awesome. Did you buy this one? <laughs> the Revival of the West or some other one? Because yeah. I have a bunch of books. Yeah, that's cool that somebody, 
people are, around the world are, are hearing me, I, my voice nowadays. Uh, I used to have like a, a blog with uh, Google Analytics installed and it only showed like the Netherlands, Germany, and maybe the USA a little bit. Nowadays, if I look at who are visiting my website, www.jmk.info, my Substack newsletter, and it's the whole world, including Africa, India, Asia, uh, Russia, <laughs> everybody, Australia, everybody's listening, everybody's tuning in now. And that's, uh, you know, that's interesting. It's an interesting, interesting feeling like, oh, when I speak, my voice, my voice is getting picked up by people from all over the world nowadays. That's amazing, really. Like in the past, this wouldn't have been possible. How in the past would you have ever had a truly global audience? You know? no. A revival of the West, yes, indeed. That's my bestseller. Uh, by the year 2025, sadly, I believe Finland will be at war with Russia. Yeah, they're going for that, right? They're pushing for it because of the string pullers. Yeah, that is true. You know, the European leadership doesn't decide anything. They are employees of decision makers. The decision makers don't even live in Europe. They live in the USA, in Washington, probably, or uh, near the Pentagon, wherever. They decide what Europe must do vis-a-vis -vis Russia and China and Iran and so on. It's all decided for them, except there's one country in Europe, Hungary, who doesn't want to go along with us, right? And that's funny that uh, they, call Hungar they call Hungary's leader, Orban, an authoritarian, or, uh, right? Because he wants to make his own decisions. So they, they insult you for wanting to make your own decisions. That's really extreme, you know? Uh, someone sends me more roses. Thank you very much. Eh? Uh, it it funds me my wine, I suppose. Poland is gonna possibly become the strongest industrial nation in Europe. Ah, yeah, there might they may it's possible that they will be uh, outclassing Germany sometime soon in the next few years. But when that happens, they're gonna expect Poland to whip up the war industry, so they have to produce the weapons so they can go to war with Russia. I mean, this, this war with Russia is not going to go away. But so far, so far, Russia has won. Russia won the conflict with Ukraine. I don't mind calling it a war, that they waged war on Ukraine, but they did win it. They took the territory. They're defending it. So they won. And now, uh, now Zelensky wants to do what? <clears throat> have peace talks in Switzerland. <laughs> Man, you could have done that bef uh, like a year ago before you threw half a million young men uh, and women into the meat grinder. Ukraine has lost its entire young, uh, young generations. The, if you look at the age 15 to 25, they either successfully fled the country, they left the country because they didn't want to die, or they died in the war. Almost, almost none in that age group from age 15 to 25, the males, right? Almost, and the females too, almost none of them are left in Ukraine. They, they are gone. You know, and so Europe, the other European nations are now trying to deport these men back to Ukraine, forcing them to fight against Russia. But then you know, you know that since Ukraine has no more personnel to fight Russia, then Poland is next. And then Germany is next. And Finland and Sweden and so are all next. They're going to keep sending us men to war because as Anthony Blinken said, Secretary of State, he said, oh, it's profitable for the USA, so we should keep doing it. Did you hear that? He actually said that at a press conference. Uh, uh, Anthony Blinken of the USA said, well, blah, 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 the war against uh, Russia, this and that, this many casualties, but it's profitable for US business because 90% of their uh, security expenses are spent on the US economy, so it's all good for them. You know how disgusting that is, you know? Good evening, yeah. Yeah, no apologies for from Poland. No. Yeah, we don't need to w fight these wars. You know, Europe has a problem that we don't make our own decisions. We're not in charge of ourselves. We're not, our leadership doesn't live here, right? And the people we have as presidents and premiers, they're all, they're all puppets. They're, they're not, often not even elected. They're just unelected employees. Who, who simply tell us what to do, but who tells us what to do? And it's, it's people from the USA, people from Tel Aviv and Washington, they tell us what to do. We have no say in it, it's just bizarre. You know, 
in the early 1900s, Britain wanted to bore us to fight German, yeah, Germany. I wonder if they did. Yeah, that doesn't make sense. You'd rather die than be a deserter. It doesn't make sense to me. If it's the wrong war, it's the wrong war. I mean, the, the Ukrainian people have been so brainwashed by their media. They were told that they were uh, a superior race fighting uh, the mutts from, from Russia. And they didn't realize that they actually got it wrong. That they're, they're actually going extinct now. Ukraine will likely cease to exist. It's over. It's the end. Right? I mean, the... The Ukrainian media re media really used the Nazi lore to fool Ukrainians into fighting Russia, all right? It, w it became like a sort of mythology, the Bandera clique and so on. They used that Nazi mythology to get the young men to fight the Russians, but they didn't realize that the only thing that was going to happen was that after they were dead, Zelensky always meant to replace them with African immigrants, you know? You know, I don't know about Finland, but, you know, the problem with all these countries is they are not even allowed to design their own strategy. Everything is done for them by others. It's like Europe is like a, a classroom, a primary school classroom, but the teacher is an American, so to speak. And it's not a good teacher. It's a selfish teacher that only cares about himself, you know. Do they have many immigrants in Ukraine? What are they going to have? You know, because like I said, the young generation is gone. So now they're going to make Ukraine the most diverse country in Europe. Presumably with immigrants from uh, India and uh, Africa. Because this is what they're trying to do. They're trying to get the Africans and the Indians to also fight Russia on Western behalf. Now, that seems very far-fetched to me. I don't believe that's going to happen, but they're going to try. Yeah, dual citizen from New York, yeah. Exactly. That's how it is. Yeah. Well. All right. Um that was it for today. Uh let me see. You can go to my uh, YouTube at the Great Johannes where I will repost this video as well. And uh, you can go to my Twitter at JohannesMKX. And my Substack newsletter, jmk.info, and my Telegram at johannesmk. Uh, yeah, different usernames. And if you want to listen to the music I make, I'm also on Spotify. My artist name is The JMK. I regularly post, well, not regularly, but once in a while I post a new track there. And you can go uh, check that out. Then I wish you, uh, wish you all a pleasant evening.